Hello everybody. My name is Candice. I am the Community Engagement Manager here at Fourth Rev. Welcome to our second event in the Exploring Careers with Product Management series. Uh, our team has been working very hard on the development of the latest King's College Product Management Career Accelerator program. And today I'm very, very excited to be here because collaborating with industry experts has really helped us to understand what it's like uh, to have responsible product management uh, in the industry and where that is headed next. Not to mention that today we have some really, really exciting um, experts in the house and I can't wait to introduce them all to you. So uh, together uh, in this collaboration with King's College and our tech uh, partners, we're basically going to be running these events to help you explore whether product management is a career that uh, for you and whether it's a direction you want to take. So as part of that, today's uh, agenda, we will be doing some introductions um, and a poll. We will also be having a panel discussion um, with our industry experts who I'll introduce soon. And then you will get to ask all your questions in the Q&A. Although, please, I do encourage you, the Q&A features at the bottom of your screen. Please, if you have any burning questions, start submitting now. If it pops up in the conversation and we notice it, um, we will definitely comment on it. Awesome. Okay. And then finally, we will just wrap up. Um, Okay, so just some rules. If you want, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know who you are and where you're from. Um, and as I mentioned, use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, we are recording this event and we will be sharing the video within the next week or so. So keep an eye out on your inbox. Okay, so for this event, we're going to be chatting to some industry insiders, as we mentioned to you, and we're going to be deep diving into things like, what are the most in-demand fields for product managers? What are the primary and additional skills you, are, you need to work as a successful product management in some of these like big industries? And like, what do the day-to-day -day responsibility and roles look like? And what, how, how might they differ? Um, so, Without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and I'd like to introduce you to um, our panelists. <laughs> um, if all of you could please turn on your cameras. Uh, thank you so much. We are still missing one person, but we'll start off with Annie. Annie is the Head of Talent Acquisition at Clio which is a fintech company that helps people improve their relationship with financial help. She has nine years of hiring experience, and she's mainly specialized in hiring product management and product design talent uh, for, for top European both startups and scale-ups. And then we also have Randeep, who shares Annie's passion for increasing diversity in tech. He's the chief product officer at Reliance Health, uh, we asked Randeep to be a subject matter expert in the development of our program because our learners can hear more from him um, about his experience uh, disrupting and transforming the health tech industry. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's also within startups and bigger industry spaces. Um, Mark, unfortunately, is not here yet, um, but... He, when he gets here, um, I'll ask him to just briefly introduce himself. Um, but for now, we also really wanted to ask our speakers a, a bit of a fun question, just so you can get to know them a little bit better. Um, we let them prepare. And I think I'm going to start with uh, you, Randy, since you are off mute. Um, we wanted to know if your team was to pick an emoji that describes you, not yourself, if your team was to pick an emoji, what would what would they pick and why? So I suspect I'd love that kind of stoic face or something like that. The likely two are probably going to be the eye rolling emoji because that's probably what I end up doing more than I'd like. Or maybe the one where your head's on fire or exploding because that's pretty much happens when you're very senior quite a lot. And it also depends on the role. So maybe a role that might be worth mentioning for the room is um, I help build and deliver the NHS test and trace the COVID-19 app. So for doing that app, head explode was pretty much what was happening for the year I was working in the NHS. 
uh, Babylon Health before that, a lot of kind of probably Icas. Uh, <laughs> the recording has just started again because um, while yeah, while at Babylon there was lots of eye rolling, I suspect. So probably those two, depending on who you work with. Amazing, thank you. Um, is is that something that your your team would pick for you specifically? Also, you agree? Yes. Because I would prefer something much more like kind of elegant and nice and classy, but that's probably what they pick. <laughs> okay, quite honest, fair. Um, and Annie, for you, what would your team pick? for you. I'm glad Randeep's one wasn't classy as well. My, mine was, as so I asked the team just before the call, um, we've got like a customised um, emoji on our Slack at, at work and it's a crying face with a glass of wine. I think recruitment can be pretty tough so um, I think that's probably one that sums me up quite well after a tough week of recruitment for sure. Um, yeah, that's the one they, they chose. I love it, the honesty. Would you also have chosen a more classy one for yourself, personally? Yeah, I was thinking cat, like a little cute cat emoji, happy smiley face or something similar, but no, they went with the wine sob emoji. So yeah, not ideal. Fair, fair. I think I think some my team might pick for me the, um, you know, the monkey see no evil um, face, because I, I can sometimes, especially in events like tonight, uh, for example, our moderator fell sick, unfortunately, she couldn't join us, um, but it always happens and you just have to keep on moving. So <laughs> it's something I often you have to get used to. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I really love to hear that. So we'd like to find out a little bit more about those of you who are in the audience today. So I am going to launch a poll right now. Can you see it? Yes, yes, awesome, okay. So which of these fields would you be most interested in going into as a product manager? Okay, I'm going to give you about 30-ish seconds. Um, these were fields that were rated as some of the top uh, fields to go into as product managers, but that doesn't mean that those are all the fields in the world. Um, so if you have any other ideas, please put them in the chat. Um, I don't know, Annie or Randeep, are there any on here you would put, uh, that you'd put on? Maybe like music tech's quite cool. Like, I always think, or like fast food, like delivery, kind of that kind of vibe would be good. The thing I love is, and that's what a lot of people talk about, is like, what's like information tech or news tech? Like, the thing about the misinformation during COVID, the thing I'd love is to be able to use that kind of AI ad tech algorithm to basically serve news articles to you. Like actually give you information that's relevant. It's going to stop you thinking that five G masks are causing COVID and stuff like that. That's probably what I'd pick. Could it be fun as well? That that's a really fun one. I approve. Uh, I mean, approve. Not that you need my approval. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, I just also noticed someone mentioned they thought the chat chat was disabled. So education. So I double checked. It is enabled now. Um, sorry about that. Okay. So um, lots of people also mentioning education. So I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. Okay, so it's quite a like broad range actually, as well as um, in the chat, life science and telecommunications have been mentioned. So but at 23% is internet of things and entertainment. Internet of things. I'm very curious to know, um, how does that work into product management? <clears throat> Do, do one of you know random pop quiz <laughs> well i mean if you talk about most you know like health tech can be wearables and that's an internet of things or if you look at wireless technology around the house so it could be anything from a smart watch to you know an egg timer on your kitchen i mean so okay that makes a lot of sense okay you can go into a lot of different fields i suppose that's also why it's important Jane says it is her passion. Um, awesome, Jane. Okay, and then we had a close or shared second banking and then other. So those were probably ed tech, I would assume, based on the, the chat and telecom, uh, telecoms. Um, healthcare is lowest on the list here, but it was rated second highest as most popular to go into or most in demand, I guess. Um, I will make sure we share the article that I, I found this, this poll on along with it at the end of the session. But thank you, everybody. Um, okay, so 
jumping off of that, I just want to remind everyone, please, that we will be monitoring the Q&A. Um, so if you would like to please post any of your questions there, we will answer them as we go. Um, but based off of our poll, um, I'm curious to know, um, uh, sorry, I have lost my screen. <laughs> uh, Annie, um, in your own experience, um, what, ha what have you seen are like the most in-demand fields that are looking for talent right now? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say, I think maybe one thing that I think people care about maybe a bit more, maybe post pandemic, I think we're quite lucky. We've got a really strong mission at Clio. And I think seeing a lot of companies out there doing a lot of really great um, things, ethically led um, people kind of doing things for people and, and helping people. I think people have realized maybe throughout the pandemic that having an impact and helping people is really more important um, and having a clear mission and goal to aim for does really help in the day to day, keeps you motivated at work. So um, I think I have definitely seen a trend where a lot of our applicants and, and other people that I speak to are looking for roles where there's a really clear company mission and it's a really kind of um, exciting one to, to aim for. So discipline, what no sort of industry wise, I'm not too sure, but I would say that kind of mission led business is one thing that I think people are now a lot more um, interested in and a lot more passionate about finding. Yeah, and I could, I could probably say as well, I've seen a change in terms of, because I do health tech primarily, I used to do gaming. Um, and I do AI. And it's funny because AI was super, super hot. People are like, why are you doing healthcare? You can go into banking or post-pandemic. AI is still important, but I think people have seen the limitations of technology, not just the support of it. Because I think something like COVID is unimaginable. People are kind of completely collapsed. Everything, it's all these unicorn concepts that people are flying around didn't help when something hit. So I think I've seen a lot more applicants in healthcare. And my current role is healthcare in the emerging markets. So in Nigeria, in Egypt, in parts of the world with far less, and these made a bigger move for some of those more social impact stuff. But I'm not going to lie, I get loads of people going, when after I left you know, the NHS, I had loads of people reach out going, I've got some amazing you know, values and business. It's going to transform how pet medication is sold. I'm not sure that's quite the mission you, you're pitching it as. Or, you know, so there's lots of companies that everyone needs a mission, doesn't mean it's a real mission. So I've seen some changes in that as well. I love that. The, the changes that like I suppose over time you can also see how uh, PM has changed and I'm keen to go there but I just want to say hello Mark welcome to the chat um apologies for being late no worries no worries we were just ch to chatting a little bit about the demands um for uh, the demands in the industry right now um and I suppose something I'm quite curious about is there's a lot of this chat about the great resignation um and for a lot of people looking to do a course, they're actually looking to switch industries. Um, so with, with the great resignation and the tech recession, um, how are we seeing more people in product management finding work or is it actually more risky to be swapping fields right now? Just anecdotally from what I see, and um, I'd like to think I'm quite well connected in the, in the kind of product scene, and uh, there's still plenty of opportunity. Uh, it's one of technology, especially when things are hard. You saw it in the pandemic where companies had to completely switch their kind of propose their propositions. There's always going to be opportunities. I'm not going to lie. I expect some tech, tech companies to obviously maybe freeze their hiring temporarily but again that's a temporary thing this is you know i think there's, there's so much opportunity in this industry particularly from a product perspective because don't forget i don't know if you've already touched on this product management is um is still a relatively new role particularly in the uk for example um and i think my prediction is i'm not clairvoyant but particularly when things are getting tough because there's a recession or custom uh, you know businesses have to really fight for customers to acquire them or to retain them, they really start thinking more about their product from a digital perspective even and, and how to improve that. So that in itself will kind of necessitate more product managers. But if you ask me right now, I still see strong demand for, for product people, absolutely. And I think product managers as well, are they're kind of the idea engine of the business, making sure they're keeping on track. So unfortunately you end up doing a lot that you shouldn't do, but you, 
and you've seen some quite high profile companies that have laid off lots of people but that's actually there's a bit of there's like these big titans like twitter and facebook that were soaking up everyone they've done freezing highs but there's still more space for the kind of smaller companies to then grow so i've definitely seen more and more interest and more and more growth it's just you might get these big ticket things which scare you and also there's a bit of a recession coming so therefore people are focusing on what they build not big valuations they're trying to build something the users want and that's what product is about you know what do users want and how do you build it but i'm sure annie's got kind of more perspective from hiring though yeah it's an interesting one i guess when you do look at the tech layoffs unfortunately it's less likely to be a pm much more likely to be a recruiter that gets laid off so um yeah i think from what i've seen on on linkedin recently and twitter i think pms are probably the safest of the of the lot really as, as well as engineering talent i think because it's so hard to hire great pms um generally even without kind of disregarding the economic climate currently um yeah i think if you've got an amazing pm there's no way that you would let them go so yeah totally agree with and the previous typically one. offshore engineering if you're going to offshore anyone not pms so you might end up having a, an engineering team that ends up being remote but the pms end up being based where you are so there's definitely some longevity in the career, I'd say. And I'm curious to know, is that the same just to, I suppose, um, Annie and Wendy, if you've worked across um, both startups and then I know um, both broader industries, Mark and Wendy, uh, much bigger uh, industries, but is it, uh, are different industries hiring uh, product management, product managers at the same rate or looking for in or to innovate and build new products at the same rate? Or is it different depending on which kind of uh, industry? I mean, which, like if you're on a scale up or a startup or. I don't know what your view is, Randy, because I, I think there's some industries uh, where you know, they still need to do a bit of catching up and therefore they might proportionally hire for more product people because, again, that's part of them catching up where other others like e-commerce, for example, there's less of a need for that because they're already at a good place from a digital product point of view, UX point of view, whereas uh, healthcare, I can imagine, but Randy, if you're the expert, they, there's lots of, I can imagine lots of businesses that are still playing a bit of catch up and therefore really need that kind of product input to, to start leveling up. Yeah, I don't think you can even say, I mean, I think you, the, the industry moves in the way the general market moves. We're faster moving. So if there's a, if, for example, if you look at what happened with the COVID vaccine, suddenly there's been a massive influx in people looking at diagnostics and for future pandemics and looking at things like biotechnology, health tech, remote health tech, the area I'm in has kind of seen a huge boom. And it was building before the pandemic and it's just accelerated now. So people in like VC firms have got specific funds that just fund in that area. So it definitely does depend. And obviously the industry is so big, you almost don't even need to follow the industry. It doesn't matter how big one area is versus another. If you're good in an area or passionate, could be insurance, could be pets, could be something else, kind of go for it because ultimately there's not that many product managers full stop. So you will, and if you've got skills and insight in that sector, particularly, so whatever your day job is now, if you move into a product role in that area, you're likely to do quite well because you know the market whatever that area is. So I don't think it matters as much about the series. What I would highlight is VC funds and companies are thinking with this recession, they're changing how they prioritize investment. So if you're looking at a series, a seed, a series A, a series B, you can investigate on Google what they look like. You might want to pick a different size company because what you do is you might get a different experience because when you're in an earlier stage company, you end up doing a little bit more of everything. And the larger the company, the more organized and structured, the more likely there's a mark there to help guide you through your training or an Annie to help make sure you've got your onboarding properly. If you're a series A, you're just thrown in at the deep end and just swim or sink. So that's probably what I would look at more, the series. I'm keen to dive deeper into that point you mentioned, like uh, to know what kind of industry you should go in, you should know what your interests are. Like, do you also, is it, what other kind of traits can someone maybe recognize in themselves to know if, product management is for them, not specifically an industry, but the this field or this role, open to the floor. <laughs> Mark. I'm, I'm happy to, and I'm, I'm at the risk of oversimplifying it. I'm really keen to hear Annie's and Randy's perspective on what they look out for and how they see it. But I start with some really simple traits that, but that are really critical for, for, for product management. So I, 
you know, it's about are you are you interested in problem solving? And that's and you think, Mark, why is that even worth calling out? But I know lots of people who don't like that. They would like to just someone does that problem solving for them and then gives them a task and they carry out the task. And that's uh, gives them energy. Product managers are solving problems for customers, often very complex problems. So that's one trait that if you feel like, yeah, I really enjoy that. I like going into detail. Um, I think you need some sort of innate curiosity to be a product person. Again, it's linked to the problem solving because often you start from a, you know, literally you start from scratch or maybe a few assumptions, but you know, you need to figure out, you need to figure out, you need to ask lots of questions. Often you'll be in a position where you don't have any of the answers, but just more questions in a way. And you need to be comfortable with that. And you need to be hungry for that. Um, so I think that's that. And I think, you know, I think what is also important to have a genuine interest in uh, technology and, and products. And again, that sounds obvious, but I think a good product manager, you know, builds up that kind of instinct for what does a good customer experience look like and is interested, is interested in always playing with products, is looking at new technology. So this, those are some of the fundamental things I would call out here. So I would say, I mean, I don't, in the in fear of agreeing completely with Mark, I mean, be a bit contentious and say yes, but simply curiosity, and you'll be amazed at how many people aren't curious. And they don't say, oh, I'm interested in stuff. It's like, no, genuinely, you're the kind of kid, like my sister said, when I was sitting on my party as a kid, I'd break apart every tool you had with a screwdriver because I wanted to see how it worked. So there's a little bit of kind of machismo, uh, kind of masochism there where I just want to see how something works. So you're going to try and keep asking questions to work out the kind of gear or the knob that's broken inside. And that kind of relentless pursuit for an idea is useful and kind of never quite being satisfied. Because you've got to have a little bit of a, okay, it's good, but could it be better? And it makes it really tedious for my partner because he was like, I'm going to just say it's good enough. Like, I'm happy with the paint color or the this or the that, but you're always optimizing. So there's a little bit of that that I find useful. But um, yeah, I think often the skill set depends on the kind of role because it's not every, like, product management is that wide. So if you're more technical, you could do product management for a B2B technical platform that does delivery of code i couldn't do that but you're very good because that's the thing you care about your cody or if you're much more user experience much bigger picture much maybe like a doctor or a nurse you could do more of the kind of user apps for a medical service so don't feel like you're excluded because it doesn't feel like you fit that mold like anything that's digital that's built needs a product manager anything so if you're using something that you could build is probably how you'd think about it I love it. That, that, that's a great uh, way to think about like, okay, are these ways to, uh, do I see myself in this role? Can I see myself uh, in these traits and doing these things? Um, I'm, I'm curious if I can just, I'm curious because Annie, you must see like thousands of profiles. What are the kind of almost like minimum requirements of, of, a, of a product management, irrespective of almost of the level that they're applying for? I'm curious. This is for me more than anything else. Yeah, I think I think you're both right. That I guess evidence of curiosity, like what have they done outside of their core responsibilities, whether that's at university or in their current role. What have they What have they done beyond the the bare minimum? <laughs> I guess. Um, and I think maybe this is more towards when you're they're actually interviewing. But I do think empathy is a really key um, core skill for a PM and just like a really great people person because you're going to be working with so many different types of people from engineers to maybe working with the CEO and then the head of data so just being able to someone that enjoys doing that and like working and speaking with people daily um, you're not going to be kind of cut off I can't imagine a PM not speaking to someone um, and just being on their laptop all day on, on their own um, and then I think growth mindset and sort of high agency are both two things I would probably try and look for particularly more for the sort of startup scale-up environments I would say so someone that um, is constantly trying to learn grow um, and has a high urgency and, and is, can work at pace I think as well so that's kind of hard to tell again from a CV but um, if you can try and think of examples of when you've done that that you can talk about in, a, in an interview I think that that can definitely help as well um, as well so yeah I think one of the things that the RPM team mentioned was product UX intuition as well. So I guess if you're looking to kind of move into PM, the PM world, maybe reading up on UX and, you know, just playing around with apps and seeing, you know, what works well, what do you think could be better? Um, yeah. And I guess kind of 
touching on what Randy was saying around that kind of need to constantly challenge and think about how you can improve things, I think as well is really, really key for sure. I actually want to build on that, Annie, and ask when you when you're getting a CV or you're looking for a, a candidate, and you find someone who is starting their career or someone who is uh, changing their career or someone who's looking to advance their career, like how what do you look for in, in those CVs? You know, if, whether that person is applying for a junior or a senior role, you know, if you get a CV. Uh, uh, from a different candidate who, let's say, is looking to to change their career, how do you know, okay, cool, this is a good candidate for a senior position or this is a good candidate for a junior position? Like, you know? Yeah, I guess you take it back to the the kind of job description that you have and the the job spec. So I think um, one really key piece of advice I would give is that when you are applying for a role as a junior, kind of trying to move into a PM role, really look at the job description, look at what they're listing, what are their core requirements, and really tailor your CV to demonstrate that you have those core skills um, and when you've used them. Um, and similarly, I think less so for senior hiring, but I think at junior level, a cover letter goes a long way. Um, so yeah, again, just really reiterating why you think you are a good match for that specific role and the specific skills that they're looking for as well. Um, pretty basic stuff, but I think it does go a long, long way for sure. Yeah, and Candice, I think I was just going to jump in because I can see a lot of questions in chat in the same area. How do you get into PM? How do you get your first role? How do you change industries? And I'm just going to kind of pick out one that someone said, how can you approach the catch 22 of wanting to change industries into PM, but needing experience without having said experience? And I think there's a lot of that feel. Now, I'm from my perspective, I've worked in gaming, I've worked in consulting, I've worked in health, all in product roles. I will more likely, if you're looking at middle or senior, not senior, but mid-level high, it's not junior entry. If someone has a skill set in the industry I'm looking at, and I work in health or AI or whatever, I'll be more inclined if that person's done a bit of a product course or has demonstrated some interest and on the side can engage as Annie was saying when I talk to him about stuff I'm like okay talk to me about an app you've used yeah this app has this user interface I like this I like that they can think about the kind of the nuts and bolts of how something's built I'm like great they've got a skill like a doctor or a nurse I can't teach that that's like six years three years I'll take that and I'll teach them product or they've got a basic product understanding I'll give them a role because if some people in this room aren't entry entry level a course on top of your existing experience would be a great entry. Just get a product job. If you work in construction, do a product role in construction. Once you're in product, you can then move to a different industry, but don't try and move industry and job role. I'd stick to one change and then do the next afterwards. So that's how I could approach it when I'm looking at CVs, if that helps. Definitely would echo that. I think I'm just thinking of one example of someone on our team that moved from customer ops into um, PM. His background was in financial services. So again, he had that core understanding of how banks worked that obviously put him as an, at an advantage, I think, um, as well. Definitely. I think, Mark. Yeah, I think I would add to that. So I'd like to, you know, it's a bit fake it till you make it kind of thing. If you if there's any, you know, there's there's a question, for instance, someone who works in, in policy roles in the government and asking, like, how do I get into product management? If you can apply some of that product thinking and show an example, maybe because of a course that you've done where you've done a project or you've done in your spare time, you've done some pro bono work for uh, for a charity, let's say, but it was very much focused on a, on a, on a particular product, can be improving the website, can be, it doesn't have to be taking over the world kind of product. That, to me, again, that's a real indicator of curiosity and some application there, which gives me a good feeling like, yeah, this person is really hungry for that. They've actually put in some of the work. They can, they've got an example. They've hustled for it. They can talk through it. That's, that's, that's a plus for me personally. Mark, okay. I worked in government, so I can work with policy people. Yes, but when someone turns up to me and is like, oh, I've got this great experience, they forget I have needs too. So unless they can package how they can help me, I'm like, I'm not going to sp spend all my energy training you because you've got this need. So there's still a little bit of give and take you've got to be about. What can you also offer me outside of product? That's the kind of thing that I often think. Yes. Yeah. Well. But uh, and I totally hear you. But like I said, I'd like to see, you know, if you can create these opportunities, if you can find these projects 
to show, you know, to showcase and use as a stepping stone to say, this is how I approached it. I've seen your job spec. I did all these things to get this, uh, you know, this pro bono project over the line or whatever, but it makes it more tangible if that makes sense. Because I appreciate, and I think that's also the point you're making, Randeep, that it's, you know, I used to be a corporate lawyer. Can you imagine trying to make the case from, yeah, I'm a great corporate lawyer. Can I now, will you hire me as a product manager? But again, I'm looking at tangible stepping stones that you can yeah. use to tell that story more convincingly. I, I think it's a really good idea to always say, like, do things. And if you manage to, like, do side hustles or side product projects or actually manage to do that in your job, I think you can be really lucky. But I think, and this speaks to some people speaking about, like, maybe you don't have real experience, like real, like in job experience, but you've done similar things. How can you demonstrate the knowledge you have in a way that can show how you qualify for a product management job? Is there, like I know developers have GitHub, for example. How can a product manager demonstrate their knowledge in a tangible way that can show someone, actually, yes, I can, I can solve your needs. Oh, I've got an idea. <laughs> so I think one thing that we we normally test this in the interview process, but I think one thing that you could do to go above and beyond is maybe if it's a website company that you're applying to, look at their website. What would you change and like make suggestions in your application? Um, I mean, I think any feedback is good feedback. So um, that could be a potential way to demonstrate your kind of UX intuition um, as a PM. Yeah, completely agree. And sometimes I've, I've I've had people turn up saying, the worst thing is I've had interviews where someone's like, I go, have you seen our app? No. I end the interview. I'm like, you haven't even bothered downloading a free app or opening our website. Like, end. Or they try and have fake it. And it's like, well, actually, the other candidates turn up and go, I've looked at your website. I've understood your challenge. Or I did a side hustle in blah, blah. And that's similar to the problem you're doing. So here I can demonstrate it to you or just have a point of view about the problems I might be facing and then I can have a conversation with you because you can convince me sometimes of your thinking by actually meeting me where I am. Oh, I saw you had this news article, I saw this problem and here's how I thought about it. Don't solve it for me, but help me think, oh, you're this person I can work with. So yeah, something like that I found quite useful. And I've equally have had people, and again, the principle I guess here is what's the smallest thing that you can do as a candidate like to Randeep's point to show that you've really considered the needs from the job spec and that you can add value there for instance I've I've had candidates where you know clearly put in a job spec that the PM needs to be able to speak to customers and I've had candidates saying yeah I just looked at your product I actually took it to a coffee shop and spoke to 10 people in the coffee shop and asked them did a UX interview with them right and I'm like okay now we're talking, right? And it's a, you know, I'm not saying oh, super scientific, and but it's to me, it shows that you know you've got you've you've got that hunger, you understand what the role is about, and you're you're also, which I think is key for product manager, you're happy to try and to to figure out and start small. Um, so yeah, that's another tangible thing that you can do. So Candice, I was just going to be rude, and actually, so I saw a really interesting question that Michael Karam asked in the chat. And I was going to throw this to Mark just because I know that you've had this conversation before. Yes. <laughs> Do you think it's important for a PM to become an expert in a particular industry? The candidate person asking worked in management consulting and has diverse experiences, but he's trying to work out whether he's specialised or not. And then Annie, I'm sure you've got points as well. Yeah, so I know exactly. And I knew as soon as Michael put that question there that we're going to bring this up. So I, I don't typically look for sector expertise, unless it's something super technical, super specific. I'm much more interested in if you have worked across these different sectors, do you have specific touch points where you can tangibly in, uh, you know, show to me how you've applied product thinking, how you delivered value to the customer, how you work with internal stakeholders around a particular product or problem. That is me. I'm much more, again, going back to what we talked earlier about those common traits of a product manager, that that is my, my starting point. Because my belief is, and I know Randy feels differently about this, that those core behaviors, curiosity, uh, the creativity that we talked about, uh, the problem solving, you apply that to whatever sector you're working at, right? Maybe in different ways, but those core components they're sector agnostic in my experience. Now, Randeep, over yeah. to you. 
No, no, Annie. I, I was Annie. about to say, I want to hear Annie. your side of the story. No, you're Annie. right. Annie, I, I want to hear Annie first, and then Andy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's an interesting one. We at Clio have hired from so, so many different backgrounds. Our new VP of product just joined and her previous role was in ag agriculture tech. So like completely like unrelated to, to fintech. So I think, um, yeah, as, as Mark was saying, I think there are some roles where you do need to be a specialist. I think if we were hiring for a payments lead PM role, then we would look for someone that has that specialized niche. Whereas um, for more generalist roles, I think it's good to have lots of different experience across sectors because I think the core um, skills that you need to be a PM, as Mark was saying, they can apply to all different industries. And, and the um, one thing I would say as well, also, because I like, because uh, for me, in my experience, great products are created if you have a bit of a diversity of perspectives as well. And, and, and that's one plus of hiring people from, as Annie said, from a, from a variety of backgrounds, because you get that real blend. And I actually, I actually kind of vaguely agree top level with all the kind of points is being a PM, you can be a PM in different areas. What I found interesting is I've worked in big tech, smaller tech, crazy consulting. You do need diversity, but if you just have I don't actually believe that every product manager is completely neutral, like just kind of blank canvas that you can throw at any product or any project. So there's definitely a benefit in specialism. I don't need every single person in my team to be specialized in healthcare or AI or tech, because then you get groupthink. And diversity isn't just of back of experiences, it's also backgrounds. And you're like, do you have people from different income brackets that they grow up? Are there different races and ethnicities, particularly in healthcare, because it has to be universal. So at the NHS, we were trying to build an app. And most of the team that I initially inherited were people who had never lived any experience of being one of those marginalized groups who were basically dying of COVID. So that wouldn't have meant they could build a good product because they lacked some of the empathy of being able to build for that community. So I obviously look for different areas, but I, I my personally have specialized quite a lot. But then, you know, for example, in healthcare, I might look at people who've done insurance or other regulated industries like banking, insurance, sometimes child based stuff, because they understand you can't just A-B test stuff because people die. So there's definitely some people in my team who understand the restrictions of working in that kind of environment and can innovate in it. Because I don't want a PM to come in who worked in gambling and is like, oh my God, I can't work out how to do this thing now because in my previous job, I could just do what I wanted. And now if you do that, it's going to change. So I definitely think it's like the Avengers. You need a different set of teams with different experiences. But what you do is you say, for payments, it has to be super regulated, super annoying, I see the person who's done it before done but for the you know for the user experience i'm going to get a person who worked in gambling because they've got the really sexy lickable buttons in ui so i can kind of mix and choose but actually i found specialism has been quite useful because you put a sector expert in a different environment and see what they can develop because that's how you get products that are completely different by getting a gambling person doing a healthcare interface for example I suppose as long as they pair with those those traits that you mentioned earlier of being willing to innovate and being curious and not close-minded to towards um, their role. I think that's a very interesting discussion um, on the generalist and uh, specialist space. Um, I just also want to mention that uh, we are going to move more into the Q&A now. Uh, so if anyone would like to upvote a question please go to the Q&A button at the bottom and upvote the questions that you want most answered. Um, so I'm going to go to the first one, which has got three votes currently. Someone not coming from a technical background, um, where would you recommend someone start? Um, Udemy or LinkedIn uh, courses, are, are they good enough to start on the career path or would you recommend like a bootcamp or something else? Uh, does anyone want to take this, Randy? Uh, Mark, there we go. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I was going to give the classic, it depends. I haven't done the uh, PM, sorry, the LinkedIn one. Um, I think it's really, you know, so you can't go wrong if you really started from zero, in my experience, whether you do LinkedIn, they will give you a baseline. Um, but if if you're trying to get more practical application, then yes, there is a boot camp. There is courses like uh, Mind the Product, which which I'm part of. There is obviously um, the course we're talking about today, because I think 
that is the main that's the main question it's not so much because there's plenty of courses and again you can start with linkedin and stuff great gives you a really good foundation there's lots of good product management books but if you're saying actually i want to do a project or i want to get real life experience from product practitioners you don't necessarily get that from those kind of online courses is my experience i don't know if you've got anything to add uh and you are deep and he's shaking i mean i think for me i would often look at i mean some of those courses it's hard because i didn't come from lots of money myself and i, I haven't done any qualifications in pm so sometimes you might go like one of those linkedin courses are great as a start but you sometimes go okay you did a certificate on linkedin that costs you eight hours work that doesn't mean that you understand anything about product but if you paired that with actually a little bit more practical experience or at least sat sent to me something about even if you're not allowed to do product innovation in your, or product work in your company, you went, I work in the customer ops team and I did a, I looked at our website, our processes were messed up. So I did this quick deck about here's how you could improve it. Here's the innovations. Here's how I tested. You've shown me a project, even if yeah. I know you weren't able to execute it. And then I can talk to you about that product project. I'm like, why did you think this? Where did you think this? I can actually have something to engage with you. The problem with someone who hasn't got prior experiences when they're talking to me, I've got nothing to talk through. And sometimes an online course doesn't give you something to talk through. So definitely do it to know how to use the language and how to structure your thinking, but then show me something with your thinking structured. Because I think, Mark, you've helped develop this course. You do actually have a project in this course, don't you? I was going to say, so obviously, uh, what I like about this, this course and this kind of accelerator program is, is, is that mix of, you know, some of the, 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 the theory, if you like, but also real kind of applying that, because that's the thing to your point, Randeep, that you want to see in a lot of these kind of online courses or even some of the, you know, one or two day courses that you could attend online or in person, which are typically a bit more expensive. They don't have that practical application, a lot of theory. And what you want is really that blend of, OK, so I know roughly what the framework is or what the theory is. How do I apply it and how can I show that to a prospective employer? Actually, I want to just ex ask you to expand a little bit on that, Mark, because we have another question here. Will this program give me projects to be able to show in interviews? Yes, is the short answer. So there will be, you know, depending on the, obviously the, the, the nature of the kind of project and the nature of the assignment will vary depending on the kind of course that you're doing but they will you know it's very tangible you will get like a proper kind of output that you will be able to show as well as the the kind of and and talk through it to Randeep's point because that's where you the way that we're structuring the course or helping I'm helping to structure the course obviously outside of my day job is really doing building in small activities that ultimately feed into the bigger assignments or like questions like assess this opportunity and then you can use that as part of your course or you sorry your assignment which you can then obviously show to prospective employers and to add to that i know at the end of the course there's also an employer project um which is a very practical experience where you actually develop the the project with a real life tech partner um so yeah Amazing. Uh, another question that I had here that something I struggle with recently is trying to differentiate between good product managers um, versus high potential product owners versus versus talented project managers. Um, what would the key competent what key competencies would you look for and test for in product managers? And <laughs> um, that's a tough one. Really tough. Um, we hire product managers at Clio um, I think give them full autonomy to really own the particular feature or kind of product that they're looking after um, so I think the we tend to not hire people that are, have just pure product owner roles in the past because I think they tend to be way more delivery focused whereas at Clio they really think through the problem they set goals themselves and um are like the owner of that particular product if, if that makes sense so uh, yeah I think as a business we tend to go for more PMs but I think it's really business dependent so um really depends on who's actually guiding the strategy is it the CEO and they're telling you just do this and then they, a kind of product owner would do really well in that role whereas if it's a kind of company like ours where the CEO sets business strategy but then 
the features and the products that they own are, are kind of really set, the goals are set by those PMs um, with the support from the technical team and the designers as well. So um, yeah, I would say it depends on the business, I think. I think just to jump in, I often train up new product managers. So we've, I've hired from the previous organizations. I did someone from customer operations. I hired someone from HR because I wanted an open, because you know there's a barrier to getting into product. And I was trying to make sure you got more diversity, more inclusion by actually lowering the entry. So having, instead of having a senior PM, I had two associates, but basically said it can be open to anyone. That was a previous role. And what we tested for then was, were they only focused on delivery? Because often the difference between a project manager is, as Mark was saying, right, okay, I need to improve uh, revenue, therefore I'm gonna improve revenue, therefore to improve revenue, I'm gonna make this go, this go higher, this go higher. And that makes sense, but you didn't stop and take a step back and go how and why, and let me try and validate if the question's even right. So the difference between all those areas are, and you can get project product managers who are very, very delivery focused and don't actually unpick the problem or improve the situation. Because sometimes, you know, the simpler solution, which is actually one step before what you're thinking about is not even doing what you're talking about at all. But those product managers never think about it because they instantly go into a solution. So that's how I would differentiate. Do they take a step back and work out, is this even worth doing? Is how I differentiate between you know, POs and PMs. Thank you, that's so practical. Um, okay, next question. What advice would you give someone in their first three months as a product manager? Don't quit. Quite, <laughs> you, you Don't quit. quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I, no, I think my, mine's quite generic, but I think just build those relationships, spend time in your first few weeks just getting to know the business, getting to know the team. Um and really don't rush into things that take those first couple of weeks just to really speak to people and understand the role a bit better, I think. Yeah plus one to that listen and learn is my simple advice really take your time to understand what play with, understand the product understand you know build those relationships like Annie said understand the competition that you know you'll be very busy in your first three months just with that kind of listen and learn piece I would have something specifically practical and it happens product managers in any level even at my level you are constant imposters you feel like you're failing because there's no one set size fits all the thing I do is very different from Mark, is different from like everything's different. So everyone's like, and the thing I see, especially with entry level, wherever they join, there's this thing where you have to show your homework. So like when you're at school, your teacher's like, show me your math and then show me your work, show me your homework, show me your working out. And what happens is when you're new to a job, particularly in the first three months, you feel the need to justify your presence. And whenever you're showing something, you end up trying to prove it. And actually, sometimes you can put all the proof in the appendix and go, I think X because of Y, and I've done a piece of research. Research is in the back, here's the outcome, but you spend so much energy and oxygen proving your place at the table that actually you probably don't need to do that. And most functional companies won't ask you to do that. So that'd be something I'd say, I see a lot of new entries at many levels doing, feeling that they need to justify why they're there. So that would be another thing I'd say. Mark? Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought Mark was gonna add to that. Um, Okay, um, and I think uh, we have another one here. I've been working in product slash design at a startup for a couple of years, building a product from the ground up. Do you think the course would be suited for people, people who already have some experience? Mark, I think I'm going to pass that one to you. Yeah, I, I think I, I definitely think so, because I think I, obviously the, the person asking question, I don't know what their level of experience is and what they know, but... I think what the course does is it really it's it's really about breadth of kind of lots of different topics. So I'm sure there will be things where person asking the question thinks, yeah, I've been exposed to that, but they haven't gone into depth as well. Or there's and I'm 100 percent sure there will be topics that maybe because of where they worked or the kind of projects that they were involved in weren't exposed to. So I think even if you have a starting point in terms of the experience, I think there's a lot that, you know, the course will give you into that you can build upon, you know, use to build upon that experience. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, this one is going back to our product owner, product manager discussion. Um, which is more in demand at the moment? Um, or they, and 
um, are they basically the same at same at some in some companies, I guess, or in some roles? I can't necessarily speak for whether which role is more in demand or not. I don't know if you have a view on that, Annie. Maybe you have better understanding the market. What I do know, and this is a you know, it's a whole topic among product managers, product owner versus product manager, um, is that some companies have a very narrow view of the product owner role. I think Annie mentioned it that you know all they, I say all, but you know their focus is this is what we're doing. You write the user stories. Uh, you work with the engineers so that they know what to build. Uh, it's almost like a, you know, what I would say with all due respect, but like a business analyst plus. Uh, equally, I've seen people with the product owner role that were just the same as a product manager in the sense that they were much more involved in the, like Randeep was saying, the why and the what before they got to the how and they would speak to customers and they look at data. and they'd... So, so, so that is a thing, but just be mindful that um, some companies will, have that very narrow view of what a product person can bring to the table. Annie, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I think demand wise, I guess my view is probably quite skewed. I've just been so into the kind of VC backed like startup world, but I would say the PM title definitely seems to be the one that's out there the most. But I guess that in some cases that PM title probably is disguising a PO role. So um, yeah, I guess kind of speak to, speak to the recruiter, speak to the team and get to know more about the role because yeah, I think it might, might be the case, particularly the kind of founder-led businesses where the CEO is really guiding most of the work and, and sort of leading the strategy. I think there may be some of those PM roles are POs in disguise for sure. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so I think last one before we wrap up, do you have any recommendations for product management resources like books or podcasts? Ooh. Go on, Annie. I think I, I as a recruiter, speak to PMs and try to stay on top of like trends as well. So I'm a big Twitter user. Would defo recommend following some key PMs in the industry um, and seeing what they're saying because I think it's free and there's some good stuff on there. Which sure. PMs, Annie? Oh, I can't remember, but I can I can dig them out. <laughs> I know their faces. <laughs> the, the one in, there's a guy in the US. I think there's a couple of the US people that are really good. Yeah. Um, you can dig them out and send them to me and then we'll we'll send them to, after, oh to the audience afterwards. <laughs> Great. Don't worry about it now. We'll find it afterwards. Um, <laughs> and deep. I'm going to say this because Mark's probably too shy to, but Mind the Product, which he's involved in, has some great talks. They've got a conference. They've got a podcast, uh, which is good. And there's lots of different kind of variety. Um, weirdly in health tech there's a separate podcast just on health tech and so often industries some of them are a bit tedious but the health tech ones are sometimes quite good um, I definitely think just being aware of because I was an I was a strategy consultant before so a lot of the stuff I like you often don't need to just follow product stuff it's more interesting to follow idea and business stuff especially if they're talking about Oh, like Twitter did, you know, why is Elon Musk buying Twitter? If you had a point of view on that and you understood why he was doing it, you would be a good product person because it's based on evaluation. And evaluation is what you're trying to increase for a business. So as long as you can think about business problems, you're probably going to be on the right track. And there's probably something more specific in your sector. So those are the things I'd focus on. And don't focus too much on specific models. A lot of people go, oh, I need to learn this framework or this framework or this framework. Great. If you need a framework, you can pick it up. Mark's probably going to disagree completely, but I think if you read every different framework book, you're just going to be drowning in frameworks. And actually what you need to focus on is how your brain thinks. But Mark? No, I, I totally agree. Uh, I totally don't worry too much about frameworks. There are some good kind of, if you're looking at books, for instance, that go beyond that and touch on some of the things we talked about today. I, you know, I have to mention my first book, which is my product management toolkit. And the only reason why I want to plug that here, and, and clearly, Randeep, I'm not shy to, you know, I, I, I do that because I wrote it very specifically at the time. We're talking about a good five years ago for people new to product management or wanted to get into product management. There is a load of podcasts on there, like Annie Men Lenny Rochitsky, there's uh, Shrej Doshi is another one. There's plenty. There's lots of good events. I think that's, you know, a bit like we're doing today. That's the best way to really meet with other product people here in life. Because what I found with these events, I don't know if that's your experience, it becomes less about frameworks 
And what the theory says, it's much more about, you know, show me the scars, show me what your lessons learned and listen to people's tips. Uh, and, and my product obviously is one, but there's loads of events out there that I would really encourage you to, to attend in person or online. Amazing. Thank you so much for those resources. Um, I know we've got some uh, names and stuff being shared in the chat and we also didn't get to all of the questions today. Um, just a heads up, a lot of the questions on like careers um, and how uh, the career support offered in the program, we will be answering in an event coming up next week. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that just now. Um, but for now, I want to say thank you so much to each of our speakers. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and your thoughts and your resources and tips with us. Um, but before you go, I'm super keen. I'd really love to know, and Mark, you can go first since you're unmuted. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, do you have a top tip for our audience who's looking to get into product? hustle be be creative we talked a lot about obviously how to get into product management and we we gave some really practical tips so don't you know just it's not always you know might not feel easy to get into product management and we touched on that but i really encourage you especially if you're looking to get into product management you're looking to change careers you've heard plenty of examples tonight i think from all three of us of how to, you know, how you can do that. Even if you're in a completely different role, you don't have many touch points, but yeah, you do, to do that, you have to be creative. And, and I do believe that programs like this one today and some of the tips that we gave as well, but uh, events or reading or trying or, hus you know, pro bono work can all help with that. Thank you, Mark. Um, Randy? So I think because everyone's so different when it comes to product, the thing advice I'd probably give is be really tight with your story and reason. A lot of people talk about this kind of elevator pitch. And I'd say, if you're moving industry, which a lot of people sound like they are, be very clear about, you know, and you can pitch your story slightly different for different people, but it's essentially like, you know, I'm Randeep, I'm, you know, I used to do this and now I do healthcare because I care about this. And I am good at a thing that I probably brought from my previous experience, which makes me more valuable. So something I can bring that's out. So I used to be a teacher, so I'm good at communicating or working in lower ability communities. And then someone who's thinking about product people, can, oh, actually, I have a lot of users who have, lower, who have lower reading ages, and this person with their experience can help. So don't just pitch yourself as, I'm really eager to learn. And like, honestly, the number of MBA students I have, I'm really smart learner. I was like, great, I've got another smart learner who's charging half your price and isn't pretending they're a kind of the next, you know, best thing for business so sometimes people pitch themselves as in like i need you know why they're talking about themselves too much so i think craft your narrative why you're changing industry and help me understand why i want you because then i can see a bigger picture than just you don't have product experience so that's my advice be tight with your storytelling and the value you can add to me outside of product thank you randy and annie would you like to wrap us up yeah of course i think obviously i think Connecting with peer, people in the PM space is really important, but don't be afraid to connect with recruiters in the PM space as well. They know the market really well. They'll give you really great advice on tailoring your CV, interview tips as well. So um, there's plenty of very product specific recruiters out there, both agency and internal. So yeah, just drop them a note and I'm sure they'll be happy to help. And, and on that note, obviously I can't speak for Randeep and Annie, but feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I can't promise that I can't, I'll come back to you straight away. But if you want to have some links to podcast or some follow up questions, I'll definitely do my best to, to come back to you if there's anything you want to follow up on. Likewise. Yeah, happy to. Amazing. Thank you, everybody. You heard it here. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for spending your evening with us. I hope it was a nice little chunk just to get you fired off and closed off for the day. Um, so just a reminder that next week, Tuesday, we'll be hosting another King's College um, event with the course governor of our career accelerator for product management, um, Professor James Smithies. Uh, he will be basically telling us a little bit about what's in the course, how it's structured, um, exactly what you'll be learning and getting out of it. Um, and we'll, you'll also get to ask him your questions if you attend. The link is in the chat if you want to join us for that. So you can register there. 
Otherwise, please don't forget to give us some feedback. Um, as I close the webinar, the feedback will pop up. Um, we really like to improve. So we'd love to learn from you. Um, anyway, thank you everyone for your time and enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye.